Everything that you or I do on the internet has some interaction with a data center. Those buildings full of computers that in marketing speak are now called the cloud. Whether you stream a video from Netflix or YouTube, chat with friends on Facebook, or do a quick Google search or get AI to do your homework, you are interacting with these huge blocks of technology. Even a simple one-man website like mine is located in a data center because that's where most of the web servers are too now. They have secure buildings with the best connections to the net and dedicated teams to make sure that when a single server fails, it's put back on track as quickly as possible. They also suck up huge amounts of power, almost all of which ends up as heat, which is then released into the environment, be that air or water. Moving and manipulating trillions of bits of data a second is hot work. GPU-assisted AI data centers are even more power intensive than the regular ones, using up to two to three times more power depending upon the setup. Because of their thirst for power and water, and they're also getting bigger and bigger, it's getting difficult to find places to locate them. Ideally, they need cheap 24 seven electricity, access to water to keep them cool, and away from populated areas and in their own secure grounds. They are also now seen as a critical part of the national infrastructure because so much of the day-to-day -day running of a country now flows through them. And building them, certainly in the US, is seen as a part of national security. If you've got the stomach for it, watch the US House Committee on Energy and Commerce discussing the importance of AI and the power that will be required to run it. And you will see just how important it has become. So where else could these behemoths of technology go? Well, into space, of course. With its unlimited solar power, temperatures in the shade of minus 100 or below, and no one able to get anywhere near without a spacecraft, this could be the ideal place to locate data centers. And if that might sound like a crazy idea, then think again, because it's already being tested, not only for space, but also in locations like the moon, which has very similar conditions, but with the added benefit of solid ground and even underground caves to put them to shelter from the charged particles of the sun and deep space. So in the words of Jeremy Clarkson, how hard can it be to put data centers in space? Now in a previous life, 25 odd years ago, I created several successful online businesses, all of which I hand coded from scratch using PHP, MySQL and JavaScript which I also learned as I went along. And the one thing I wish I had at the time was some way of speeding up the learning process and doing it the right way with less trial and error. It's been 14 years since I did any serious programming, but today backend programming is often done with Python, SQL and Go. And our sponsors, boot.dev, have created a system for you to learn these and more from the ground up in a fun and intuitive way. Learning to program can open up a world of high paying jobs as a software developer or working for yourself to build up your own products and services. And that's the route which I took. And believe me, it can be a life changing opportunity. Boot.dev takes you through the basics as you work your way through the examples to build real projects, gain the experience, points and achievements. This isn't some learn it in a week course. To become proficient takes time going deep into the theory and practice, and to do the whole curriculum takes around about 12 months, but you can do it in your own time and at your own pace. Don't worry about getting stuck. Boots, the AI bear wizard has been trained on every lesson and knows what you should be doing and sees where you go wrong and will guide you, but he won't give you the answers. You don't learn by just being handed it on a plate. It's free to create an account so you can read and watch in guest mode. But the paid membership opens up hands-on coding, AI assistance, progress tracking, and access to the boot.dev Discord community for real human assistance. Get started today by going to boot.dev and using my code CuriousDroid to get 25% off your entire first year on the annual plan. And it's also risk-free with a 30-day no quibble refund policy. The one thing that makes this whole exercise even worth thinking about is the reduction in the price of getting anything into orbit compared to 20 plus years ago. 
with SpaceX leading the way and Blue Origin building up their own capabilities, both of which are now using reusable boosters. Back in the shuttle days, 1981 to 2011, the price of getting one kilogram into low Earth orbit was up to $54,000. When SpaceX Falcon 9 came online in 2010, the price plummeted to $2,720 per kilo. With a Falcon Heavy, it's dropped to $1,400 per kilo. And if Starship can be got working reliably and with regular flights, it's hoped it could reach as low as $10 a kilo. If and that's a really big if at the moment, that can happen, then putting up the equivalent of the contents of a medium-sized data center with 2,000 servers into low Earth orbit weighing around about 40 tons, that's just for servers networking and cooling, not including the spacecraft itself, would cost around about $400,000 at $10 per kilo, compared to the current price of $56 million if you use SpaceX's Falcon Heavy at $1,400 a kilo. To give you an idea, to build a 2,000 server data center on Earth, all in is around about 20 to 25 million at the moment. So maybe, maybe in the near future, it won't be prohibitively expensive to get the gear into space, but that's only part of the story. Once you're in space, the two things that data centers really struggle with here on Earth are much easier to deal with, power and cooling. As we've seen, flipping bits by the trillion per second uses a lot of power, and almost all of it ends up as heat, which has to be got rid of. By using satellites, each to host a mini data center, which can then be linked with others to create one much larger one, the power and heat are on a much more manageable scale per satellite. Large solar arrays can generate power 24 seven if they're in a high enough Earth orbit and with no weather or clouds to get in the way. Getting rid of the heat is a little more difficult because there is no air or water to carry it away with convection. So it has to be radiated into space, which is a lot slower, but this has been done on the ISS and other spacecraft for decades. Once you're in space, we have to face up to the fact that it's a pretty hostile place up there. And now you want to fill spacecraft with high density servers and storage in a place that has charged particles from the sun, capable of flipping bits of data, and others from deep space capable of destroying the very MOSFETs that make up the CPUs, GPUs, memory, and pretty much everything else in a server. And that's not to mention the risk of space junk traveling at 10 to 15 kilometers per second. That's up to 10 times faster than a bullet. Even something the size of a grain of rice at those speeds has the capability of punching a hole through the side of a spacecraft and hitting whatever is inside literally causing an explosion due to the release of all that kinetic energy. Now, as we saw in a recent video I did about the difference between space-based computers and those used here on Earth, there are ways to radiation harden chips and surround them with shielding to protect them from all but the more powerful cosmic rays. But this makes them very expensive because normally there are only a few computers on board most spacecraft and they're all built in very small quantities using highly specialized parts. A space-based data center would have thousands of complete computers or more spread across maybe hundreds or thousands of satellites. So for a high performance server that will be used here on Earth to get the most amount of power in the smallest space would currently use something like the Intel Granite Rapids dual CPU with 120 cores and 240 threads running at two to three gigahertz. And a server like that would cost between $20,000 and $70,000. The fastest space rated computers using a PIC64 and eight cores running at one gigahertz would cost between $100,000 and $500,000. Not only over five times the price, but a fraction of the computing power, with the space based computer being 120 to 1,000 times slower than its ground based cousin, depending upon the work being done. But then not everyone needs super high performance. For many space missions, the ability to get the data back to Earth safely is more important. So having a space-based electronic drop box, so to speak, for deep space communications would help ensure that gets done. Equally, space probes carry just enough computing power to get the job done. Calling upon a space-based data center with GPU-assisted AI would allow quicker problem solving without having to wait for the signal to get back to Earth, be processed, and then sent back out to the spacecraft. 
which if your space probe is in the outer edges of a solar system, might take over eight hours to do the round trip. Which brings us on to reliability. In space, no one can hear you scream. That is if you're a technician trying to fix an intermittent fault on a server. Basically, there won't be anybody coming to fix a wayward server in space. These data centers will need to be self-healing. It will be just easier and way cheaper just to turn off a faulty server and have one less available. Maybe with the right design at some point in the future, it might be possible to make robotic repairs to swap out faulty equipment. Mechanical hard drives, which are normally used on servers on Earth, are the cheapest option for mass storage normally, but for space, these are not a go-to solution. Size, weight, vibration, radiation, wide temperature swings, and high power consumption mean that SSDs, or solid state drives, would be used in space instead. In 2017, NASA tested 20 off-the-shelf SSDs in a server on the ISS. After a year and a half, nine of the 20 SSDs had failed, but the server kept working. They did this by using special software that detected and corrected errors caused by cosmic rays and proved that standard off-the-shelf parts could be used. More recently, NASA has been testing Fison's 8TB M2 SSDs, with them successfully reaching a technology readiness level of 6, allowing them to be used in space in Lone Star Freedom's miniature self-contained lunar data center, which was sent to the moon in February 2025 as part of the Intuitive Machine's Athena lunar lander. Whilst the data center worked fine, the lander itself fell over on landing, effectively ending the mission. But the lunar data center was the only payload that was not affected by the incident and carried on working till the lunar lander ran out of power due to an obscured solar array. This was being tested to prove that a data center could be placed on the moon and could be the ultimate in data security in case of a catastrophic event happening here on Earth. Although the mission was a failure, Lone Star's data center was a success and a new mission will put a data center at the Earth-Moon L1 Lagrange point in 2027. Others in the race are Axiom Space, who have partnered with astronaut Tim Peake and are planning to deploy two orbital data center nodes by late 2025, potentially attached to Axiom Station Module. These would be AI-driven edge computing radiation-hardened servers and optical communications network to handle critical workloads in low Earth orbit. StarCloud are another developing GPU-heavy satellite compute clusters, launching a demo in mid-2025 in partnership with NVIDIA Inception program. But the big movers in this area are the Chinese. They recently launched their first cluster of 12 satellites for a planned AI supercomputer constellation in space, which they say will eventually contain up to 2,800 satellites. This is what keeps the US awake at night. The Chinese are already inching ahead in the race for AI dominance and integration into all levels of its society and military. And with little in the way of internal opposition, what the Chinese government wants, it normally gets. The limitation here is power, not political, but electrical. Massive AI data centers require a massive amount of power, something which China has to import by the way of coal, gas, or build out huge wind and solar farms. But the variability of renewables isn't that great for creating a base load. The US, on the other hand, is rich in fossil fuels, but is trying to go clean with renewables, which are seen by some as holding back AI development. Again, watch the US House Committee on Energy and Commerce video, and you'll see just how complex and tangled the issues have become far better than I can explain here. And this is why putting AI into space is so attractive. The power and cooling are taken care of just by being there. The rest are just engineering challenges that any suitably advanced nation like the US or China can handle. We've seen that we can put up tens of thousands of small sats. The next challenge is to make AI clusters larger and in volume, because the first ones to reach dominance in AI may well be dictating terms to all the other countries soon after. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, share, and subscribe, and a big thanks go to all of our patrons.